Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and this week we're going to once again dive into the topic of influencer marketing and the corrupt nature of this business unfortunately. I had a ridiculous exchange with an agency representing a major brand and I wanted to share that with you as an example of just how toxic the culture around influencer marketing continues to be. So let's get to it. Now, before we dive into the topic today, I do want to make a couple of things clear here up front. The first is that I am not opposed to YouTubers, influencers, or whatever you want to call yourself, taking money for sponsorships. It is a necessary part of the business. Every publication since the dawn of free media has had advertising. It's just the nature of the business. What has changed in 2020 over where we were perhaps in 1920 is that the distribution costs now are free. Back in the old days, it was very expensive to print a newspaper or have a radio station or a TV station. And as such, that distribution scarcity built up very large organizations because there was a lot of money funneling into very few outlets. And those resources allowed those organizations to have a separation between editorial and sales. But the reality of the economics of media in the 21st century is that we're seeing those large media organizations slowly dismantling because the economic model has been flipped on its head. And as a result, independent creators, which is what I prefer to call us, uh, have the ability to do this on our own and make a better living than we would if we were working for one of those organizations. But we don't have the luxury of a large operation that can separate editorial from sales. So what do you do about that? How do you keep your ethics in place when you still have to go out and sell ads essentially for your channel? Well, the solution, as I have just decided to do on my channel, is to disclose, disclose, disclose. If there's a sponsored post, you tell everybody up front so they know, and the viewer can decide whether or not to trust your judgment knowing that you were compensated in some way for that review. And we do that here on the channel. I will disclose to you when someone's paying for a video. I will disclose to you when we get product in for free. And if there was some discussion or something with the brand where they directed content, which I never allow to do, but if that did happen uh, in the course of a piece of editorial content, I would disclose that as well, along with past relationships. And that's the kind of stuff that you need to do in this decade right now, because that's the nature of the business. And unfortunately, Many channels and influencers or whatever you want to call them are still not doing that. Uh, the recent brouhaha over the fire Festival is a great example of some of the bad things that happen within the influencer space. And I started doing my disclosures after I had a dust up with an ad agency called Famebit about five or six years ago. Uh, they were running around paying people $250 to review the Ring doorbell. And they had an interesting strategy, which was go after smaller channels and just fill up the search results with positive reviews of the product. And they flat out asked for a positive review. I said no. And when I bought the product and reviewed it anyhow, I disclosed the fact that they approached me with this deal because I saw how many reviews were out there on YouTube and I wanted to make sure people know where I was coming from with it. Uh, they took offense to that. Ring denied it. Uh, this was before Ring was acquired by Amazon. Uh, and then Famebit kicked me off their platform. But after that, what was interesting was that Famebit uh, really doubled down on making sure creators did proper disclosures. Like it became like the law of the land, whereas before they were not asking anyone to do anything. And I have a feeling the FTC might have reached out to them and advised them to get their act together. It worked out fine for them. They got acquired by YouTube and they made a bunch of money, but it was important, I think, for me to fully disclose what happened there and talk about the parties involved. All right, so let's start off with this email that I got from this agency. And unfortunately, things are not getting much better out there. Now, I am going to, in this case, redact the name of the agency, the brand, and the person because I don't know who directed who to do what here. I don't know if this person working at the company was uh, acting on her own volition or if she was told to act that way. And it doesn't really matter because this is more about the fact that the culture of this industry is so rooted in transactions that the concept of doing something on an editorial basis is completely foreign to them. And you'll see that as we work our way through this exchange. Now, this started uh, with a, a question about audience demographics for a potential sponsorship. And I responded to this initially 
uh, with my current rate, which is artificially high. And the reason it's artificially high is that I'm not looking for a lot of sponsorships right now. Uh, we have an ongoing sponsorship with Plex at the moment. We have a few other companies like HD Home Run that we bring on from time to time, but I haven't been taking on any new ones primarily because my revenue is doing well from other sources. My YouTube revenue is doing better. My affiliate revenue is now the main driver uh, for revenue here on the channel, which has significantly altered my strategy over the last 10 months. Uh, affiliate links are when you click on a link in the video, it brings you to Amazon or some other place that I'm linking you to. And if you buy the product there, I get a small commission. And I've always preferred that because I can produce content independently. I don't have to answer to anybody. I don't have to get it approved by anyone first. And I think the audience values that independent review of a product more than something I'm being paid to do. Although the sponsorships that we typically do here on the channel are value adds in the sense that we're doing a tutorial or diving deep into product features like we do with Plex because I never do product reviews for money. And if the company sends us the product free of charge, we disclose that, but I never allow them any input as to what goes in the video. It's all completely done by me and they don't review it first or have any input as to what you end up seeing. And that's a very uh, clear line in the sand for me. So I get back to her with my rates because that was what she was asking for. But I also said that I'd much prefer to get the product in for no compensation just to review it. And then she writes back with an excited, thanks for getting back to me. Can you please confirm that if the product is sent over for review, that it will be integrated into a video or be a dedicated video. And then she asked some crazy questions here, like, can you share past work that would be similar in this sense of a product review? We just want to make sure we have a good idea of the video length integration and how in depth you go talking about the product. And this immediately started raising warning flags for me because this is now the brand uh, hoping to have some control over content, or at least the agency in this case. They want to know how long, how many videos, basically wanting that transaction of, okay, we're going to send you this, we expect this in return. And it gets worse than this. So then I ignored that because I'm, again, my warning flags are going off, but they got really insistent. And I finally wrote back and said, I think this is going to not work here for me. I think it would be more efficient to work directly with their PR folks as this is an editorial versus a marketing thing that I was asking for. Have them get in touch or pass along a contact. She writes back and says, thanks for touching base. Unfortunately, we're handling PR for this campaign, so all communication is done through our agency for the client, which is not representing their client very well, in my opinion. Uh, then I write back and I said, look, I'm interested, but I need to be clear that this is an editorial thing and I can't allow a brand to dictate the content, its length, what is said, et cetera. A review is just that, a review of the product. Typically, I do a single product per review. So I wanna pause right here and let you know that typically this is not my experience in getting products in for review. In most cases with the major brands that I'm doing reviews with like Lenovo, HP, Dell, Asus, uh, I work with their PR departments internally. And what happens is, is they treat me just like any other member of the media. They'll contact me and say, hey, we've got a review unit of this laptop. Would you like to take a look at it? I say, yes, they put it in the box, they ship it to me, I review it, I put it back in the box and send it back to them. The video goes up. Uh, there's never any input that they make into the video. They don't ask to see it first. Every once in a while, I might get a detail wrong and they'll tell me, hey, you were wrong about this and I might do a correction or something, but generally it's hands off because that's how professionals treat each other not here. So this gets better. So uh, I explained to her what a review is. Uh, she writes back to me and says, the client really loves your work and is happy to send you both the new whatevers in exchange for, exchange for uh, two dedicated review videos. We understand that these are review videos and that the client cannot review the video before it is live unless that's okay with you. So they would love that opportunity. Uh, let me know if you're happy to proceed and I'll draft up the contract. There's a contract? Yes, there's a contract. We'll get to that. So she uh, sends that, I write back and I say, look, I'm interested in checking them out, but your suggestion that the product is being supplied contingent on the quantity of content is a no-go for me. I'm happy to take the products on loan and return them when I'm done. So then she writes back, thanks for getting back to me. I'm a little confused here, definitely, and hope you could please provide some clarity. In your initial email to me, you mentioned your sponsored rates, but also I'm actually more interested in getting product in for review without compensation. Do you mind clarifying what exactly the terms are for the sentence above and how it misaligns with the proposed terms in the contract that's attached? And we'll get to that contract in a second. But I did want to make sure I understood exactly where she was coming from. And I asked her, is the expectation that the review be a positive one? 
She says, we hope you'll love the product and it's a positive review, but we do value honesty with our creators, yada, 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 saying, Yo, no, you have total independence. Do we? Let's take a look at the contract they sent over. So first of all, again, I never get contracts for reviews. This is completely unprofessional when dealing with an editorial organization. I don't think the New York Times or The Verge or anyone else has to do this. So they send over this agreement and let's take a look at some of the fine print here. First and foremost, influencer agrees to perform services, again, the transactional nature of this, during the term in a manner which does not re reflect adversely on the agency or the brand or services. Good thing I didn't sign this contract. Isn't this crazy? So right out of the gate, you really can't say anything negative because you are signing a contract that says you can't do anything that would affect, reflect adversely on the brand. And adversely affected is going to be in the eye of the beholder, meaning the brand in this case. Additionally, uh, they provide some additional things that needs to be done here. So the influencer is going to receive whatever. Uh, they'll be sending you two products to review, which you'll use to shoot content for your YouTube channel. Influencer to provide social media content, providing a full review on the devices and its main features. All social media shares must include a link to the product pages on the website, web links to be determined. And then they're saying that you need to do two videos and each video will be a full product review. They're dictating how long it needs to be up for. And here's the worst part is that they are not giving the creators good advice on their disclosures because all they're saying is that you need to have uh, a sentence in your description box about the product being gifted. Uh, but there's no mention here that the creator has to say it in the video as well. And if you go on the FTC's website, we've done a whole video about this. It is crystal clear that in video content, you got to lead off with the disclaimer saying that it came in free of charge, yet they're not putting that into their contract here. And then they're asking that a whole bunch of things get linked to in the description back to the brands, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. This is far from a professional editorial relationship. This is a transactional relationship, which is everything that's wrong with the industry. And if we flip over to the other page here, uh, you can see that they are um, looking for video analytics. They want uh, the videos to be up by a certain time. And then if you don't do what they want you to do, you can send the stuff back at your own expense. And it's just like, come on, seriously? Now, what really ticked me off throughout this entire back and forth is that she could not wrap her head around the fact that an editorial review cannot be transactional. It just wasn't registering. And I don't think she was dumb. I think it's the fact that this concept is foreign to their industry. It's just not done. And I wrote back to her after looking at this contract and laid it out. Like I tried to be as direct as possible as to why I have a problem with what she's sending over and why I find it insulting. And she responds back saying the same thing. We do feel more comfortable if there's a contract in place to ensure that a review will be shared in exchange for a product. And I even said to her, if that's the concern, loan it to me, I'll send it right back to you. I don't need to keep this stuff. I got more stuff than I know what to do with. So I just kind of left it at that. I wrote back and said, look, this is, you're just not getting it. I'm gonna to try to work directly with the brand, even though they don't want me contacting them directly. I do know people there. I reached out to them, I'm still waiting to hear back. It is a holiday weekend here in the US and we'll see what happens from there. But this is just the nature of the business right now. And this is what bothers me because the future of media is what I and many, many, many other people do on this platform and others. It's going to be these little single one or two people operations that are putting people out in front of cameras here to relay information and you will live and die by the trustworthiness of your personal brand. And if everyone's locked in these transactional agreements, how does this industry, the independent content industry, become something credible? And that's my concern is that we have to become credible. We have to be credible. And thankfully, there are many creators in the space, including some large ones, moving in a very positive direction. And I'm really grateful to uh, Marcus Brownlee and Mr. Mobile, uh, who mentioned me on a podcast recently, not because I'm getting credit for something, but because they are beginning to think about the things that we've been thinking about here in regards to how you disclose your relationships with your audience. Again, nothing wrong with taking sponsorships, but be clear about it. And in their podcast a few weeks back, 
Uh, they talked about that, and actually Mr. Mobile said he adopted some of his disclosures from the ones that I've been doing, which is great, because that was part of why I wanted to make that video five or six years ago. It wasn't about shaming fame, bit, and ring. It was about the fact that I felt we as creators need to do better, and it's good to see now that many, many are starting to realize the responsibility they have as media creators and are taking steps to be transparent. So I propose something here. I looked this hashtag up and nobody has used this yet. So we're gonna use this. It's called the Creator's Pledge and it's going to be pretty basic at this point, but I would like for you, if you are a creator or perhaps you to let your favorite creators know that they should all take this pledge. And it's very simple. There's no organization behind this. Just that you will be transparent. You will use disclosures. You will make the industry better. If you agree to do those three things, put that hashtag out on a Twitter and get it out to some other people as well so that more and more creators start thinking about this industry differently so that we can build credibility of this space. Because if media is going to have a future, we need credible voices doing it. And I know there are a lot of credible people out there that I think can really advance things further but we got to get this transactional garbage out of the ecosystem and make things much more clear so viewers know where we're coming from. Because if we're not clear and transparent, the actions of others will reflect on those of us trying to do things the right way. Because if nobody believes anything they see out there, no one's going to have a credible voice. And one other piece of advice for creators is to create a document that you can use as a guide and will also help inform your audience. So I have my policies and procedures up here at lon.tv slash disclosures. And I refer to this every once in a while to make sure that my disclaimers on a particular video are accurate to my policies that I set. And it's very helpful to have that because you don't have to think about it all the time. You can just go and look at what you've set for your own policies and make sure you adhere to them. And having that document public is really important so the audience knows uh, exactly where you're coming from. And what's interesting is that this link has been in my video description towards the bottom uh, ever since that fame bit and ring thing happened. And I've had 33,000 plus clicks on that link since then. So clearly the viewers out there who are finding our videos are very interested in this topic. And I think the more transparent you can be about your relationships, the better. Again, there's nothing wrong with taking sponsorships. Just be clear about it and be clear about what you are communicating to your audience so that they understand exactly where you're coming from and what relationships might exist between you and the product you're talking about. Now, this week's wrap up in full disclosure is being brought to you by all of you. And I want to thank our super chatters this week who contributed during one of my live streams. Brian Parker made a gold level contribution, and we also had contributions from Handheld Obsession, Travis Rhodes, and California Travel Videos. I want to thank everyone for their participation on those live streams. And we have two new supporters here on the channel who signed up to the YouTube membership program. They include Steve Cromwell and Red Robbo's Workshop. I want to thank everyone who contributed this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and everyone who watches on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. And if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. And again, we also support the YouTube membership program. And you can get one of those cool badges that you see there on the right next to your name whenever you leave a comment or participate in a chat. So this week on the channel, we had three live streams. We looked at a new Lenovo Legion 7 that is on loan from the company, and we're going to be reviewing that later this week or early next. Nice new gaming laptop. Uh, we also looked at the DJI Ohm 4, which is a smartphone gimbal that I purchased. And then we also had a few other items that we checked out on one of my Office Hours videos, including some stuff that came in uh, free of charge through the Amazon Vine program, and in one case, directly from the manufacturer. On the Extras channel, we took a look at one of those items in a review. It was the Keymecker Mano 603 trackpad. That was one of the Amazon Vine program items that came in. It's for Windows, by the way. And then on the main channel, we looked at three different things, including the ThinkPad X13 from Lenovo, which is a Ryzen-powered compact laptop. Nice little rugged machine there. Uh, we also took a look at the Logitech G915 gaming keyboard, a rather pricey but compact wireless gaming keyboard with some nice clicky keys. 
And we also got in the Panasonic HomeHawk window camera, which is a security camera for the outside that actually sits inside. It sticks to the inside of your window. And by the way, that's how a good uh, discussion with a company goes. They reached out and they said, hey, would you like to review the camera? No expectation of involvement in the editorial process. I had a few questions for them that they answered that helped me understand the product better and I put it up. It wasn't the best product. I said it has some faults, but it seems to work okay, and I can let the viewers make their own decision from there, and I think that's how it should be, and I thought that was a, a good, honest review of the product as well, so that is my take on that. So this week on the channel, we've got a couple of things planned. Uh, at a minimum, I definitely want to shoot my video about the Shadow Game Streaming Service, which allows you to rent, essentially, a Windows 10 PC in the cloud that you can do whatever you want with. And we're finally gonna get that video going. A couple other things came in last week that uh, threw a wrench into that plan. Uh, but we also have some PCs to look at this week. I've got at least three on the docket. Uh, so we have that Legion 7 laptop. We got in the Dell XPS 17, the larger of their new flagship laptops. And we have another stick PC to take a look at as well. So lots of computer stuff I think will probably be on the horizon this week. If you want to be notified every time I put up a new video, you can click the bell and be sent notifications every time we go live or upload a video. We have other channels you can find me on that you can see here on screen. I am going to try to get the podcast going again. The audience was not great on that, but I've heard from a few of you looking for those audio versions of this show. So I'll probably start getting those going up again just because I know a few viewers would like to have them there again. So I'll try to help you out there. If you want to engage with the channel, we've got my very occasional email list at lon.tv slash email. We only send those out when there's something big going on. We have the Facebook group, which is just a wonderful place to interact with me and other viewers of the channel. We've got over a thousand people in there now. And then we have my store where I sell previously used items like two Acer laptops that I purchased recently. Uh, so check them out there. They are very lightly used because we just reviewed them here on the channel. They're now reset and ready to go to a new home. Uh, and you can get notified every time we add something to that store by going to lon.tv slash store alert because I still do buy a lot of stuff that you see reviewed here on the channel and that's what I do with it when I'm done. If we don't have a use for it, it gets sold so we can buy more stuff to review later and that's always the best way to do reviews. That is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I would love to get your opinions on this conversation I had with this person from the agency and I think really what it speaks to is the fact that we as independent creators need to approach our business differently because if the culture out there is all transactional, it's not going to be good for our credibility down the road. Again, let me know what you think down in the comments below. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Tom Albrecht, Chris Allegretta, Mike Patterson, and Bill Pomerantz. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv s.